Well, I think I think you said in the last podcast that didn't record, Jackie, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, you said something about, do I account for this in the therapy room? Yeah. And then the answer is yes, so I'll say it again, yes. Yeah. Because it's not, as you're quite right, it's not just about rejection and being triggered back to the past, but it's also about perceived loss or loss in our histories. And it would be very odd not to account for the significance of the day. Yeah, because I, th- I think what I asked was, would you bring it up or, you know, make a comment on that it's coming up? It, the, the, it's weird because sometimes I think that there's a fine line in therapy on how we direct it, whether whether we're going to trigger the client by saying something, whether it's our job to, to bring it up in therapy or just wait and see how it goes. So the conversation we had, you know, was me asking you, would you mention it? And you said a definite yes. Definitely. Yeah. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 88 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And today, we're going to be talking about relationship breakdowns inside and outside the therapy room, because it's coming up to Valentine's Day. That's a good stir. A good day to have this conversation then. It is, it is. Um, we've actually recorded this once before, only I forgot to push the record button, so we're having to do it again. <laughs> so uh, I doubt we'll be talking about the same things as what we did last time, but I'm sure it will be just as good. <laughs> I thought least, I'd come clean with the listeners, Bob. We're not perfect. We don't get it right all the time. At least, Jackie, at least. Yeah. Okay, Let's let's hit the button then oh we already hit the button so it'll be okay yes it's already hit thank you for reminding me (laughs) no we've got it recorded okay you know it's an interesting subject area because mostly when you see people in therapy unless it's couple unless it's couples therapy you're really dealing mainly with the relationship with themselves yeah because unless the relationship with themselves is healthy then the external one is likely to break down. To mirror that, yeah, definitely. So is it possible then for people to have a relationship breakdown with themselves? <laughs> I think most people come to therapy. That's exactly why they come to therapy. Okay, I've never thought of it that way. <laughs> they usually come to therapy because they <laughs> because the relationship with themselves has turned sour or they've forgotten themselves or they cut part of themselves off, or they're fragmented, if they've got a healthy relation with themselves, they probably won't come to therapy. Yeah. Because yeah. they'll be feeling okay about themselves and they'll pick relationships which are okay. Yeah. And over, over the last few months, I've been doing quite a lot of stuff um, on my own things about self-care and self-love and you know self-growth, self-awareness, self lots of things about the self and people feel really uncomfortable with anything that's got the word self in it somehow it it feels selfish to people when I talk about self-care and self-love and self-worth and all those things do you mean it's like self-indulgent yeah so they feel self-indulgent yeah and like if you know if we talk about self-love it's like blowing your own trumpet and thinking that you're wonderful and everything and it's it's not the case where do you think those messages come from then? Well, we all know where they come from, Bob. <laughs> yeah, leading up that road. Well, that's it. It's it's scripted <laughs> stuff. It's from our background. Everything comes from our past. And you know, the, the things that we hear when we're growing up, we kind of absorb as our own beliefs, you know, and, and what I've been doing with myself as well as other people is to, you know, challenge those thoughts that are these my beliefs or are they some that have kind of been imprinted on me or that I've, you know, just adopted as mine as I've been growing up. And that's, it's quite a journey to go on. It's quite a journey. Now, I just came up to do this podcast and my wife said, where are you going? I've, and I said, Let's see, do these podcasts. And she said, oh, you're obsessed with uh, reality TV. 
So I think <laughs> that's reality TV. Oh, you've just been watching Love Island, Australia. You've got Love Island, England, Love Island, goodness knows what. Yeah. You're quite right. I do get obsessed with um, reality TV programmes because I think I'm always so interested in the psychology of all these processes. But anyway, so if we take Love Island as just one of the many we could pick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have these characters in in in, in villas, and they 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 they're supposed to get on with each other, and you know, sort of uh, hook up with each other. And the 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 couple, which <laughs> lasts the longest, basically gets the fifty thousand dollars. But it's not really that's the advertisement afterwards, which makes them really. But I, I like watching it, and um, it's interesting. It's how quickly you can see. Uh, the the people on there that don't have very good relationships with themselves, yeah, because they're always having to face possible rejection on that show, and many other shows like that. So, relationship with yourselves very very important. I'm not surprised to hear what you've just said. The people give themselves a hard time if they actually concentrate on themselves, because as you've just said. The message is like, oh, that's big headed or you're yeah. selfish. I think not only comes from parents, by the way, but it was often is a cultural message. Yeah. Our culture sort of is that way, isn't it? That's it. What you know, what's socially acceptable and things like that. Yeah, definitely. I think it's worth persevering to have a good relationship with yourself. I think so. And I think you know everything comes from inside us but a lot of us me included you know we look for external validation to prove our worth which if we don't get it or if it suddenly disappears then that has a, that can have quite a big impact on us whereas you know if we know it truly inside that we are we are worth the good things and we are you know worthy of being happy and fulfilled in our life then what's happening externally doesn't have as much of an impact on us that's right. And Valentine's Day, of course, is a perfect one for maybe feeling rejected. Yeah. Yeah. And I can remember it. feeling really rejected as a teenager because I didn't get any Valentine's cards. And probably about, I think I was about 13 or 14, sitting on the back step of, you know, my house at home, thinking nobody's ever going to love me and I'll never get married. And I was like 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. So we seek internal, we seek external validation. It's so important to us. Yeah. And we seek it even more if we don't get it from the significant others that we desire it from. Our yeah. first object is usually our mother and father anyway. So if we don't get the validation we need from them, we uh, we not only feel rejected, but we feel unhappy. Yeah. So, you know, this time of year with relationships, it's it can be quite, you know, impactful for a lot of people if, you know, th everything's changed with COVID and, you know, living crisis and everything that we're going through at the moment. But, you know, anniversaries or certain dates, we touched on this on the recording that I didn't record <laughs> about, you know, Christmas and New Year, and you were quoting some statistics about, you know, people taking their own lives at certain times of the year and how increased they are. Yes, if you go into A&E on Christmas Day, New Year's Day, um, the statistics of uh, people who self-harm or unfortunately at its extreme uh, take their own lives are very high. Yeah. I don't know what it is on Valentine's Day, but these... These days where we're supposed to, you know, these days are so significant for people, um, are often the days when people feel the most lonely or they feel alone or they yeah. feel triggered back to difficult times in their own history. Just yeah. like you just said there. So there are millions of people um, who get triggered by Valentine's Day who are remembering the aloneness of those days and the rejection of those days, and often have a difficult day. Yeah. 
Or people that aren't around anymore, maybe significant others that are no longer with us. It can, you know, it can be a time of grief and sadness and, and all sorts of things. And I think, I think you said in the last podcast that didn't record, Jackie, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, you said something about, do I account for this in the therapy room? Yeah. And then the answer is yes. So I'll say it again. Yes. Yeah. Because it's not, as you're quite right. It's not just about rejection and being triggered back to the past, but it's also about perceived loss or loss in our histories. And it would be very odd not to account for the significance of the day. Yeah, because I, th I think what I asked was, would you bring it up or, you know, make a comment on that it's coming up? It, the, the, it's weird because sometimes I think that there's a fine line in therapy on how we direct it, whether whether we're going to trigger the client by saying something, whether it's our job to, to bring it up in therapy or just wait and see how it goes. So the conversation we had, you know, was me asking you, would you mention it? And you said a definite yes. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely, I would. Um, because most people have reactions to things like Christmas, um, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, birthdays, anniversaries. Yeah. And Day, all those those significant days uh, need to accounting for yeah and then the, the client has a choice whether they want to talk about that at the time or say no I'm absolutely fine with it and continue but like you said at least you've you've brought the subject up and you've allowed them the space to talk about it if that's what they want to do yeah and just imagine Jackie if you're seeing a couple on Valentine's Day yeah <laughs> it'd be odd yeah. if you didn't mention it wouldn't it it would it would really yeah and it's a good basis to bring like you saying about you know when we talk about relationship breakdown you know that that's there's a whole heap load of things that come under that umbrella mm. whether uh, that children or partners or parents or you know work relationship whatever it is it's not necessarily you know a, a husband and wife or or partners in a loving sense that way Absolutely. And I think that that's a very important thing to bear in mind, that when we talk about relationship breakdowns, it could be all the all the uh, examples you gave just there. Yeah. And more. Yeah. So what, what do we do about, well, a really good example of couples in in the therapy room that are going through, because I'm not sure whether we, we spoke about this last time or, or in previous podcasts, but one of the things I was always conscious of when, we're, when working with couples was that there isn't any guarantee that it's going to end the way that they think it will end, going to couple therapy, that there's always a chance it can be, talking them through how to end a relationship appropriately rather than fixing a relationship, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And always with couples, I get a contract for whatever it's about. So when they come in, I check about, is this about staying together? Is this about breaking up? Is this about, what, what have you come for? Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's very important. So this isn't about the therapist take any responsibility to keep them together, for example. So in the contract, usually most people say, uh, I want to explore, you know, the communication difficulties or whether I want to be with this person or whether I don't. And I will always say, well, we'll go where we go. This isn't about then staying together necessarily. I hear there might be a desire by one of you to stay together. But this therapy is to explore where this relationship goes to next. Yeah. And if you eventually both of you decide that it's about separating, I will, of course, support that. And you can have an individual couples therapy to achieve that task. But it certainly isn't the responsibility of the therapist to think they've got to keep them together for some unknown reason. Yeah. And relationships are, you know, they kind of mirror us in a way. You know, I, I always say, and I'm sure I got it from my training, that, you know, it's a connection between two people and, and we're only 50% responsible for that, 
you know, interaction, if you will, the other person is 50% responsible. So in relationships, you can't give 100% because the other person has to give something back to you. And often the communication between two people is the issue with relationship breakdowns. Oh, it nearly always is. And one of the things about couples work is um, invariably they'll go into a process of making you a parent and they want the parent to resort to um, somehow wave a magic wand and make yeah. a okay or take the pain away or resolve things for them. And of course, you can never be that person. No. For them. No. And it's a painful process working through it, you know, in, in couples therapy, because it's a safe space where people can talk and you're kind of a mediator in that respect that they each get time you know to listen and to speak and and those sort of things but often they say things that they've never said to each other before they've never felt able to or had the opportunity to i think couple therapy is very powerful yeah and i did quite a lot of it um and it, I was very honoured to be part of the process. Um, and, you know, I think I think it needs a specialist training, actually, couples therapy. I mean, I know a lot of therapists who do individual therapy, and then because of that, they feel they can do couples therapy. And to a certain extent, that may be true. But I think there's, I think it's really important to have actually specialist training for couples therapy because it's just it's a different art and a different process i found it a completely different entity than what you know individual therapy is when i first started i think we we did training on our four-year training to kind of cover that but even that i didn't feel like i was you know properly equipped for it when i first started doing it even yeah. my chair position do you know what I mean? I didn't want to be skewed more towards one member of the couple than the other. So to try and make sure that I was central to both of them and, you know, that they each had equal time to talk and think it's it's a minefield when there's three of you in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think, well, I always get amazed when in supervision, um, the therapist says, well, I've started to take on a couple and I know very well they've not had any training in the process. Oh. So I used to say, have you had any training? Then you've been on a training course to enable you to do that? Oh, no, it's the same as individual therapy, isn't it, really? And, of course, we know it isn't. No, completely different. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I think it's... Uh, I think what you said about being neutral is very important. Uh, yeah. But I also think that there's a lot to learn, which is different from when you train people to be individual therapists. Yeah, because for me, it, it was exhausting. It, it was very taxing because you're not only looking at the individual's body language and, you know, what's going on there, but you're also looking at the way that they interact with each other. There's like so much going on in such a short space of time. It's it's exhausting. It is exhausting and um, it's also very rewarding. I yeah. mean, uh, I preferred individual group work, being a group therapist or individual therapist, I think before couples work. I don't mean I didn't enjoy couples work or it wasn't something I um, thought was for me. However, um, I preferred individual and being a group therapist, I think. Um, but going back to my point before, um, they definitely need to have some training, I think. Therapist yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, or of anybody that does group therapy, that's something that I've never, I've never done. Um, yeah, that fills me with fear and dread because... <laughs> You know, my my thought process is that you're constantly putting out fires, you know, and if I get overwhelmed sometimes with couples, then I have no idea what I'd be like in a, a group situation. But relationship breakdowns happen within a group situation as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
Um, absolutely, of course they do. Having said that, in a group situation, I didn't take um, married couples on, or I didn't take partnerships on. Um, I'd send them to one of my other groups, also somewhere else. Yeah. So I didn't have the situation you were talking about. What about if there's conflict within the group? Pardon? What if there's conflict within the group between people? Oh, that's a different thing. I mean, if you're talking about, for, you know, people having conflict, of course I work on what that is all about, but I wouldn't take a romantic couple into a group or a married couple into a group. No. That doesn't mean people listening here, here may have a different view on that. I'm just saying that was my a rule for me. Yeah, and I think it's a sensible rule. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, but it's it's interesting because we're going back to the difference between the individual and you know couples therapy. But you are quite right. I would be dealing with conflicts and breakups and friendships and things in groups, and we'd be talking about say, uh, or I'd be supporting someone uh, through a possible uh, breakup externally. Yeah. But uh, get back to where we started. I do think the most important relationship is with yourself. I wrote a, uh, I thought it was a good, one of my best articles. I didn't, I'm, did it go to Cosmopolitan? It's years ago, 15, 16, 17 years ago. No, longer. Gosh, quarter of a century ago. That's a long time. But it was called um, Your Most Important Relationship. And it was all about, you know, be compassionate with yourself and yeah uh, love yourself because from that position are you more likely to pick relationships which are honoring and loving to you yeah and like you know we touched on it at the beginning our you know relationships are modeled to us i suppose when we're growing up and you know having a fear of abandonment if our you know upbringing wasn't that good um and things like that we will take that into relationships that we have with people you know you might find that one person in that relationship is quite needy or clingy and doesn't want the other person to ever go out on their own or do anything in you know independent of them and things like that so you know working on yourself your self-esteem your self-worth and all those sort of things not only helps you but it also helps massively in relationships yes and i i was interested that to hear though it wasn't surprising for me to hear that the people that you've worked with in this area uh found it challenging really challenging mm. yeah it's I, th I think it's more the fact that it's it's looking inwardly and doing all that sort of work rather than outwardly and getting validation for it. You know, we live in a social media environment now, so the amount of likes and clicks you get on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, you know, strokes your ego and, and gives you a sense of, you know, recognition and everything. But take that away, and it's really difficult for people to to know their true self-worth without it being told to them by somebody else or something else. That's right. That's right. And I think one of the most important things from childhood is to build up what I would call a stroke bank. Yeah. Logically. So a stroke bank for people listening, it's a transaction analysis term again, a stroke is a negative or positive um, recognition. So I'm talking about positive stroke bank here. So that under stress, we can talk to ourselves positively. Yeah. We don't build that up. Um, we can be pretty sort of um, empty. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and we've got nothing to say to ourselves. Yeah. Which is positive. Yeah. And when things do happen, like relationship breakdown, we've got nothing to fall back on. 
you know, which it, it is, you know, it catastrophic for some people when a relationship breaks down. You know, one, they don't know how to be a single person and independent on their own, but it just reinforces all the negative things that they think about themselves. And, it, it you know, it can be really difficult. That's right. So I teach people or work towards people being interdependent yeah. rather, rather than de dependent or symbiotically enmeshed. Yeah. So it helps if they've got a good relationship with themselves though, so they can focus on, you know, being interdependent rather yeah. than dependent or symbiotic. Yeah, definitely. But they need to be able to have a positive narrative to themselves and they need to be able to treat themselves compassionately, I think, for that to happen. Yeah. And I, th I think that's that's a really good point is, you know, often we find it a lot easier to be compassionate towards other people, whereas not necessarily with ourselves. You know, if we make a mistake or we get it wrong or or anything like that, we're usually really good at beating ourselves up as opposed to, you know, yeah, being compassionate. And if we knew a better way, we would have done it a different way, I'm sure. Absolutely. And another thing to look for when we're in this area is loss and loss and abandonment and neglect in childhood. Yeah. I was just thinking my daughter who was very attached to a um her a young friend uh and very Early on, I think me talking about six or seven, this year this friend that she'd attached to left and left the country and had to because their parents were from another place. And Jessica got so upset. Yeah. And um, I think that if we carry those abandonments or we think in some ways we're a fault for people leaving us, we often find it very triggering. Yeah. If someone's gonna leave. Or we think somebody, you know, is going to abandon us when in fact they might not be at all, but we put that situation onto the relationship. Yeah. Then it can become very unhealthy. Yeah. And particularly when we're young, you know, and, and vulnerable, the slightest thing can feel like abandonment. You know, if your best friend doesn't turn up one day for school because they're ill, it's, you know, it's a big deal to some children particularly if they've only got one or two friends at school <laughs> yeah and yeah and if they're only children as well i think they don't um for a very early age they don't learn to do central tasks for it they're important for relationships like sharing maybe yeah Le learning things that they would bounce off their sisters or brothers or um other friends they play out fantasies in their own heads rather than learning these developmental tasks which are needed for relationships. Yeah. So these are the sort of things as a therapist you would go back to when you when you're exploring uh, maybe relationship breakdowns which should be reported by the individual in therapy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Valentine's Day and you being in therapy is, is an opportunity to go back and to, to revisit some of those things about the past and you know how relationships were modeled to us if you know if we've got parents that are constantly arguing and you know one of the things I used to say a lot with with my clients is often as children growing up we see we see the arguments we see the you know the the shouting and and all those sorts of things I'm kind of talking personally now about my parents but I never saw the makeups and the comeback togethers so I never knew what happened it was like we have a massive argument we don't speak to each other for ages and then suddenly everything's back to normal so I never really knew the process of talking and communicating and sorting out a problem it just was a problem and then it wasn't a problem yeah these are all things to explore I think in therapy when we look at breakdowns in relationships or relationships staying together. Another yeah. area is celebration. Yes, yeah. So, for example, well, let's take Valentine's Day. I don't think he, I don't think he's, a healthy relationship is about waiting for one year to get validation. Exactly, yeah. I think a healthy relationship is when you celebrate each other. 
each day or each week or at least every i think i was going to say monthly but i think i would i teach my clients to concentrate on celebration in the relationship regularly rather than you know having to wait a year for example which i think is very extreme yeah i can remember i'm you know my my daughter and my son-in-law are both in the military and before they got married they used to go and see padre and they did i think it was a six or eight week course if you want to call it that on relationships and they used to go through different activities every week you know with each other because you know the percentages of, of breakdowns of marriages in the military is is higher than you know the general population or whatever and even now to this day one of the things they do every single day is to tell each other three good things that have happened that day and three not so good things that have happened that day they sit down and eat the meal and it's just a conversation between the two of them. And I love that. I think it's an amazing thing to do. Oh, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, because we we don't, you know, it takes them five minutes, if that, to do it. But it's just that time to connect and to regroup and, you know, get everything out from whatever's gone on during the day and just get back into being a couple again. Wonderful. I mean, as a therapist, we're dealing with uh, relationships all the time. We're dealing with relationships between ourselves. Yeah. Uh, we're dealing with relationships that are externally. We deal with fantasy relationships. We yeah. Think, we deal with relationships that have gone and passed. We deal with the loss of relationships. We deal with the fear of relationships ending. We, we, <laughs> we deal with the projection people have on uh, other relationships. We yeah. deal with jealousy. We deal with envy. We deal with competitiveness. Yeah, I probably could go on and on for Definitely. a lot longer. Yeah, but these yeah. are things we deal with all the time. So, if you are listening and you're a therapist, don't be, you know, afraid to broach <laughs> the subject. It's coming up to Valentine's Day, and talk about relationships. I couldn't agree more. Okie dokie. Thank you for that, Bob. So what we're going to be looking at in the next episode is different methods and approaches in therapy. And we must remember to record it this time. We must remember. I will. <laughs> I'll, it's set to automatic, Bob. So oh, OK. We haven't got to do that again. It will never happen again. Right. Okay. Until next time, Bob. Thank you. You're welcome. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.